if you're diagnosed with a brain aneurysm, it's important to know your options and kind of what the, the pros and cons are of each kind of management strategy. Having the right uh, approach to an individual aneurysm is what's most important. My name is Josh Seinfeld. Uh, I'm a Director of Endovascular Neurosurgery at the uh, University of Colorado, and I am uh, very thankful to the Brain Aneurysm Foundation for letting me give this uh, talk on uh, strategies, uh, both old and new, for managing brain aneurysms. I am a, a consultant for both Medtronic and uh, BALT, who manufacture neurovascular uh, equipment. And the reason uh, we're talking about aneurysms right now is because they're so common and have such an impact on people's lives. One in 50 people uh, are estimated to have an unruptured brain aneurysm. A lot of these people are never going to know uh, that they harbor a brain aneurysm because the rupture rate is only a fraction of the number of aneurysms that are present in the population per year. But as, as it is as common as about diabetes or asthma, even if only a small fraction of aneurysms rupture per year, that leads to a significant amount of morbidity and mortality within the population with about 100,000 aneurysms rupturing per year in this country and as many as 30 to 40,000 deaths. Of the people who do have a brain aneurysm rupture, about 40% will pass away eventually as a result of the brain aneurysm rupturing. About a quarter of people who have a brain aneurysm rupture won't even survive to make it to medical attention, which is why the stakes are so high. Brain aneurysm treatment has really evolved uh, over the uh, past uh, 100 years. Uh, it started in 1934 with the first aneurysm clip where you take a small metal clip, uh, go in in a surgery through the skull to find the aneurysm and secure it uh, by putting a metal clip on it. And this excludes the aneurysm from circulation. As aneurysms are in their nature outpouchings of a blood vessel where the wall on the blood vessel is weak, in 1990 uh, began developing devices uh, that can treat the aneurysm from inside the blood vessel. So instead of going in from the outside and reconstructing the blood vessel with a clip, uh, the first aneurysm coil was developed and used. And that's really become a pretty standard mainstay of treatment uh, since. In this technique, we go in through the blood vessel, work our way usually either through the blood vessels in the arm or leg all the way up to the head where we take a very small catheter, position it inside the aneurysm and push these little aneurysm coils through it to fill up the aneurysm and disrupt the blood flow. This has led to a, a real spawning of additional uh, technologies that are um, really phenomenal in their design. Um, well, the next big advancement was really stents, kind of like what they use in heart vessels uh, to treat uh, acute heart attacks where blood vessels are open. We use them not necessarily to open the blood vessel when treating an aneurysm, but rather to form a base or a floor uh, at the bottom of the aneurysm that'll hold coils or other material inside to serve as a scaffolding. And so here in this depiction, you can see blood's flowing through the blood vessel. And if there's an aneurysm arising on the surface of the blood vessel, the stent will cover it and allow us to put the coils inside without risking the coils falling down and blocking off the blood vessel that we're working to keep open to provide blood flow to the brain. And since the advent of these devices, we've had additional iterations of stents, what we call flow diversion stents that are capable of sealing an aneurysm off from the rest of the circulation without any additional coils that are dense enough in their meshwork that they actually disrupt the blood flow enough to cause the aneurysm to heal over several weeks or months without any additional material, as well as uh, what we call endosacular aneurysms, which are little um, mesh balls or marshmallows that will actually sit inside the aneurysm as a single unit to disrupt the blood flow and block off the aneurysm. The modern 
sort of brain aneurysm and cerebrovascular team is generally multidisciplinary. This is a picture of, of our team at the University of Colorado, actually, from a few years ago. There have been a couple changes, but you can see it consists of physician assistants, neurosurgeons, radiology, and neurology, each bringing their own kind of special uh, views and, and talents to the team. And if you're diagnosed with a brain aneurysm, it's important to know your options and kind of what the, the pros and cons are of each kind of management strategy. It's always uh, a consideration whether an aneurysm should be treated at all or not. Observation is a very reasonable uh, approach to a lot of aneurysms. There's no procedure related risk. We like to think that the procedures we do minimize risks to patients, but any invasive procedure carries some potential morbidity, no discomfort with observation as long as the aneurysm doesn't rupture. Certain aneurysms, especially those that are under five or seven millimeters and located on the blood vessels in the anterior or front portion of the brain have a, a reported very low risk of rupture uh, per year. <clears throat> the caveat with that is many of the aneurysms that we do see that have ruptured are in fact considered small aneurysms. And one of the likely uh, explanations for that kind of paradox is that while aneurysms rupture at a low rate when they're that size, there are so many of them in the general population that a significant number do uh, cause a problem every year. With observation, we also uh, kind of avoid the possibility of medical harm to the patient. We want patients to look perfect. We don't really care about the perfect picture uh, on our screen. And then there's also the psychological effect of living with an aneurysm. Some people are okay knowing that they have an aneurysm that poses a small but persistent risk to them. Other, others are really nervous about it and can't go about their daily lives and, and, ha and uh, have a, a satisfying uh, existence knowing that they have this ticking time bomb. If you do decide to have an aneurysm treated, <laughs> there's two basic classes of approaches. One is an open craniotomy and clip ligation or referred to as open surgery. This is a little bit more invasive because you actually have to go in through the skull, which increases the recovery period. Uh, in some cases, this may be the most durable approach though, uh, in that it, it reduces the risk of the aneurysm recurring over time. Uh, and also in certain cases, if the aneurysm is large or is already ruptured, it allows us to to remove parts of the aneurysm or blood clot around it to decompress the brain and adjacent structures. The other uh, main uh, approach or strategy to treating uh, brain aneurysms is called an endovascular approach. This is where we work from within the blood vessel to fix the aneurysm. And this is generally less invasive because what we're doing is putting in a catheter into a blood vessel. It's almost like a large uh, IV catheter uh, into an artery. And then we go up through the blood vessels, working our way through the uh, maze work and, and into the aneurysm with small catheters uh, to provide whatever treatment we're gonna do. This usually results in very little recovery uh, as long as the procedure goes as planned. Um, it's very minimally invasive. Uh, it's really just the um, recovery of having gone through anesthesia. Uh, there is, the uh, understanding that in some circumstances that this is a little bit less durable. For instance, treating large aneurysms with coils alone will lead to a significant recurrence rate, maybe in the 30 to 40% range in certain aneurysms. However, some, some techniques when stents or flow diverting stents are uh, employed where the aneurysms are smaller, uh, the durability is a lot better. Um, it also allows us to treat an aneurysm without uh, manipulating brain that may already be injured or damaged as a result of the aneurysm rupturing or being very large. And so, you know, I think that having the right, the right tool for the situation is what's most important. You know, if you're, if you're traveling on, uh, if you're trying to off-road in your sports car, it's not gonna go very well and vice versa. If you're trying to race in your Jeep, it's not gonna go very well. And so I think having the right uh, approach to an individual aneurysm is what's most important. And that's 
why it's so crucial to have a, a good multidisciplinary team that can really look at every case individually because uh, they are all unique. And so these, this is just kind of a graphic depiction of what the treatment looks like uh, for each approach. Um, with an open craniotomy, we're working through the skull. That's uh, showing an opening in the skull with the underlying dura, which is the layer between the skull and the brain underneath. Whereas on the right is a picture of an angiogram uh, showing the carotid artery with some measurements taken to see what type of devices we would use to treat the aneurysm. This is an example of a case of a large uh, aneurysm that is in the uh, back of the head on what's called the basilar artery, which is the artery that runs up uh, the brain stem. This was previously treated. You can see on the right screen there, which is a, a fluoroscopic or x-ray image shows those black strands, which are coils from a previous procedure in the aneurysm and the aneurysm has recurred. And so, we take measurements, we place a, a flow diverting stent and, uh, across the base of the aneurysm, and in this case use some coils as well given the size of the aneurysm. And so on the left is, is the pre-treatment picture and on the right is the uh, picture during treatment of the aneurysm. You can see there's where we put additional coils in and there's the pathway that the catheter takes to place the stent. There's the stent uh, in place. And so once we complete that treatment and bring the patient back for uh, an angiogram at a later time, you can see here that we've gone from a big recurrence of an aneurysm to now you can see the coil material uh, that's within the aneurysm. However, the aneurysm is completely excluded from circulation and therefore no longer a risk to the patient. Here's another example of kind of a challenging uh, large aneurysm. Uh, this one I think looks kind of like a boxing glove, but it um, uh, incorporates uh, multiple blood vessels that are rising at the top of the carotid artery uh, here on the right side. And so there's the aneurysm, there's the neck of the aneurysm and what we need to protect somehow if we're gonna treat this through an endovascular technique and so if you're gonna treat these aneurysms in, in this location with this anatomy, if you're gonna do it with clip ligation with an open surgery, you, you have to be worried about a lot of little small blood vessels that typically arise behind the aneurysm that are gonna be hard to identify and hard to uh, peel off the back of the aneurysm to protect during clip reconstruction. And so my thought here is if we can perform an endovascular repair, then, we'll be able to keep those little blood vessels open, not risk trauma to them, but we're gonna to have to be able to protect the neck of the aneurysm, which is where the aneurysm meets the parent blood vessel. And so in this case, we're able to do that by taking into consideration the anatomy of the blood vessels around the base of the brain, what's called the circle of Willis. And so in this case, we're able to go with a catheter across uh, the middle of the brain from the left side. And this allows us to put a stent into the blood vessels that are at the top of the internal carotid artery on the right side to form a scaffold across the base of the aneurysm. There's the course of the catheter on angiograms, right is left and left is right. So that purple line is the catheter going up the left carotid artery across the blood vessels in the center of the brain, what we call the anterior communicating artery, and across the base of the aneurysm. We then have a catheter within the aneurysm itself, following the course of that green line, which allows us to put the stent across the base of the aneurysm, highlighted in blue, and then we put coils inside the aneurysm to repair it. And that leads to a really nice repair of what's a uh, otherwise very complex aneurysm. And so I hope that gives some insight into uh, the strategies we use to treat aneurysms and the thought process that goes into deciding what's the best way to handle an individual aneurysm. And thank you everyone for paying attention and thank you uh, Brain Aneurysm Foundation for all the support and assistance you provide uh, patients. 
um, really doing great work and uh, I'm, a, I'm very honored to be able to be a part of this. Thanks.